I'm John Michael McGrath, and this is the Agenda on Politics. If there's one thing Torontonians seem to complain about the most, it's the TTC. There are the political battles, like whether or not to build a subway over an LRT in Scarborough. And then there are the everyday frustrations we all deal with, from service disruptions to the crush of people at Bloor Young Station during rush hour. If you've been there, you'll know the feeling of seeing hundreds of people lined up along the subway platform, perilously close to the edge. You'll never get politics completely out of transit planning, but I think more weight has to be given to uh, processes uh, that are in place. That's Andy Manahan, Executive Director of the Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario, or RCCAO for short. Their newest campaign asks, will someone be hurt or killed before Toronto builds the relief line? Andy's going to tell us in a moment why that's not alarmist. I've known Andy for a few years. He's advised governments and is a frequent public speaker and writer on transit and infrastructure issues. We dive into the relief line, high-speed rail, and transit politics in general. And for those of you asking why we're so Toronto-centric today, we also get into the reasons transit priorities in Ontario's capital city are so urgent for the rest of the province. Andy Manahan, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here. Thank you. Let's start off with the basics. Give me the RCCAO's pitch for why the downtown relief line should be the number one priority in this election. Sure. Well, the relief line has been on the drawing board for over a century in various forms. uh, And it's one of those projects that uh, due to perhaps, uh, you know, recessions in the 1930s and, uh, you know, economic slowdowns in the 1990s, for example, it uh, has tended to slip down the ladder. I think with the growth we're seeing in the downtown core, uh, not only office buildings, but a lot of people living downtown and and certainly high-rise developments, uh, the need is even more urgent right now for a relief line to take pressure off actually the entire network uh, of the TTC. Um, What we saw in late January was a situation uh, due to a number of circumstances where uh, safety was a major concern. Um, if someone had been pushed over the edge, for example, there could have been a serious injury or a fatality. Um, so this isn't the only reason for the relief line, but I think it uh, uh, brought into crystal focus that there is an urgent need to try to expedite construction of the relief line. We're currently discussing two phases. There's the relief line south, which would go from roughly the center of the city and around Queen and Young, Queen and Bay, uh, would, would travel east and then go north to Pape Station. Yeah. And then there's the northern segment from there, which would go from Pape Station at least to Eglinton and, and possibly perhaps Shepherd. beyond to Shepherd, correct. Yeah. Traditional thinking has been to really focus on that southern segment because that's where you get sort of the most passengers for the least money. Mm-hmm. But I think some of the recent work at Metrolinx has suggested that they they would really like to prioritize going even further north. Do you have any thoughts on that? That is a relief to see that, uh, if I can use that pun, uh, because really in the past, the the, the small U, Eastern U, has been talked about, and we need the bigger extended arm U, uh, really going up to Shepherd uh, eventually. But going to Eglinton would, again, take pressure off the Eglinton Crosstown line uh, and also have the network benefits uh, for the Young line, as well as, obviously, the Bloor danforth line. And in the politics of this city, it may be easier to build a $10 billion subway line that goes to Shepherd than a $5 billion subway line that I just goes so. to Danforth. Mm-hmm. In my question, I called it the downtown relief line. You are, I think, deliberately referring to it as the relief line, dropping the, the downtown. Is that deliberate? Uh, it is deliberate. Uh, people like Ed Levy a number of years ago were using the phrase regional relief line because that... Um, connotated that uh, this was uh, something that would benefit the whole network. I think there's a perception, and that's probably one of the reasons why uh, the relief line has slipped down the priority ladder, so to speak, is because when you use the phrase downtown relief line, there's a perception that it's only going to benefit riders that live somewhat in the in the core. And really, um, even if you live in the downtown and you never took the relief line, it would benefit suburban transit riders more so than those living downtown. And I think that's one of those misperceptions that we're trying to uh, clarify. 
Sorry, you mentioned uh, Ed Levy there. Let me back you up a little bit. Uh, tell me about Ed Levy and what, what he has uh, written. Ed Levy wrote a book uh, a few years ago. I think it came out in 2015. It was originally sponsored by the Neptis Foundation, uh, entitled Rapid Transit in Toronto, A Century of Plans, Projects, Politics, and Paralysis. And it basically started around 1910 and ended in 2010, the year uh, that Rob Ford became mayor of Toronto. And, of course, that was a whole other uh chapter that uh, he didn't want to get into kind of midstream. But uh, this particular book has a section um, on the so-called uh, regional relief line, and it talks about plans that were put forward um, back around 1909-1910. One of the um, reasons for streetcar subways, as they were then known, was because uh, the transit system in Toronto was uh, owned privately and uh, those owners had rights to all surface routes, the streetcars that we had. So eventually the system um, that we saw starting in the early 1950s with the Young Line basically from Union Station up to Eglinton where we are right now uh, was uh, done as a subway because that would get away from that kind of private sector hole that, the, that was uh, held. The book does talk about um, some original designs. Uh, it was referred to then as the Queen Street subway. It was, a, again, a streetcar subway which would have uh, run under Queen Street. There's uh, uh, different plans that uh, have come forward over the decades, but it was basically going to be another U, similar to the Young University line, but a, a larger U. Uh, and there's various alignments that have been proposed over that period of time. The headline on your website for this campaign, uh, trying to, to make this a provincial priority in this election says, will there be a serious injury or fatality before transit riders get some relief? Are you being alarmist? I provided uh, a, an advance of the first ad that we put in the paper in February to Mayor John Tory's office and uh, they uh, assured me that uh, this was a project that was uh, on the radar for the City of Toronto and TTC in particular and of course Metrolinx in the province. Um, I provided a second uh, ad that w appeared in the Star Metro uh, several weeks ago and uh, just to give the mayor's office a heads up and uh, I won't say who in the mayor's office said this but uh, they advised me that this was somewhat inflammatory. Whether it's alarmist or not um, I think is besides the point. It is an issue that um, uh, John Lawrence from Spacing Magazine uh, had raised uh, basically the day after that particular incident where people were toes over the edge and couldn't move on the elevators um, and it was a near crisis situation so I don't think we were being alarmist. Uh, the Toronto Star, uh, their legal staff uh, did take a second look at it just to make sure uh, <laughs> that we weren't being uh, too over the top uh, but uh, in the end we got the go ahead uh, with that particular heading that we used and the hashtag that we have is Gimme Relief which if you're a music fan is kind of like Gimme Shelter Rolling Stones so <laughs> we tried to be catchy on it. Are there other solutions in the works uh, or that we should be doing before the relief line comes online? According to the transit gurus such as Ed Levy, Dick Soberman, Dave Crowley, the folks that I'm relying on because I'm not what you would call a transit expert, we're uh, a construction association, we like to build things and whatever the politicians decide eventually we'll, we'll end up building or our members will end up building. Uh, but all of these folks have indicated to me very strongly that uh, this is the number one priority uh, for a variety of reasons. Safety is obviously one. Um, Redundancy is an often overlooked issue that's extremely important. If um, we're bottlenecked uh, like we were in, uh, in late January with respect to the Blung, uh, Bloor Young Station or other stations, uh, basically we're not moving uh, and our economy and, and people you know, come to a standstill. So uh, we have both uh, you know, overcrowding on the uh, Young Subway line as well as the Bloor Danforth line. We've all heard stories where uh, people who may be getting on at Young and Eglinton can't get on until the fourth train goes by and some people in fact will go northbound and uh, get on at Shepherd, uh, for example and then come south uh, just because it is uh, so overcrowded. So that kind of overcrowding is untenable. Um, I do know that some documents that Viva has put forward with respect to the extension of the Young uh, subway north have said that by 2031 uh, the Young line will be overcrowded uh, in fact, it's overcrowded right now, um, and 
other options that have been looked at uh, and certainly that are part of our transit video series that we put out four years ago have talked about uh, solutions such as um, providing relief through uh, go lines. Uh, so, for example, York Region residents can get downtown uh, from the Stouffville line to Union Station. So that's one option. Um, other people have talked about creating an express subway along the Young Street route. Um, according to Ed Levy and others, there are some engineering and operational constraints. The, the Bloor Young Station, for example, is nearly impossible uh, to expand any further. Right. Um, so that's a real bottleneck right there in terms of uh, what can be done. Um, and the um, redundancy aspect, as I was uh, alluding to earlier, so if line one shuts down, uh, you can still move people around and get downtown. So what we're seeing right now is the Eglinton Crosstown LRT, light rail transit, is being constructed right now, whether that opens 2021 or 2022, I guess is debatable right now, but that will load more people onto the Young Line. So we already have an overcrowded system. It's going to get more overcrowded by the early 2020s. And with the growth of the downtown and elsewhere in the city, uh, it's only going to get worse. So this is why this particular project is a critical one right now. Hi, everybody. We're just breaking into our conversation with Andy Manahan to speak with Leanne Kotler, one of the producers on The Agenda with Steve Pakin. Uh, Leanne, welcome. Hi there. Uh, who do you have on the show tonight? We have Don Drummond on. Uh, for those of you who don't know who he is, he is the rock star of the economics world. Uh, Dalton McGinty commissioned him to write a report that is called the Drummond Report about how we can make Ontario economically viable and sustainable in the public sector. And that was in way back in 2012. So six years later, what happened to the report? So we asked the author himself, how much did the Liberal government follow his recommendations? How much did they not? And uh, the questions we put towards him are, are we on track to be economically sustainable, given that the budget um, has what many people are calling so many freebies. So really, what is the economic temperature of Ontario? Is it as uh, healthy as Kathleen Wynne might suggest? Is it a disaster as Doug Ford might suggest? So heading into the election, we give people the lay of the land so they can make an informed decision come June. Well, I think our listeners would like to see that, and it'll be online later tonight, and they will be able to watch, of course, at uh, 8 o'clock on the agenda. Leanne, thanks so much for your time. No problem. I just want to focus on one thing you said there, the Crosstown, you know, the government announced funding for that in 2010, if I remember correctly. Um, it will not open until 2021, 2022. The Crosstown, I think, arguably is a, a less complex uh, transit project than the relief line is going to be. The relief line is going to be tunneling through some of the oldest and densest part of the city if it mm -hmm. uh, if we build it. There's no way that even if we had money on the table today, mm -hmm. it's 2018, there's no way a relief line would open before 2028, realistically. Correct. Um, <laughs> I mean... So it, what do we do? Yeah. And, and like no party... Uh, has I mean sorry I should say the New Democrats have set, have put the relief line in it's their the platform. Right. Uh, I suspect it's going to feature in the Liberal platform, but it wasn't in their most recent budget. Mm -hmm. are, are we looking at a crisis in the 2020s, one way or another? Even if we could build the relief line today, there are certain short-term improvements can be made. Uh, certain station platforms can be widened, so there are. Um, you know, ways to alleviate some of the pressure, but it's only going to get worse. Uh, whether you want to call it a crisis or, uh, you know, words that may be conceived as, uh, perceived as inflammatory, you know, <laughs> that's possible. Uh, some of the public meetings that have been taking place already uh, with respect to the relief line south 
have talked about um, having to go very deep into bedrock uh, for this particular subway project so you would avoid the utilities that's a benefit because most of the projects like uh, the Shepherd subway were basically cut and cover it was light sand so it'll be a different kind of tunnel boring that was done in the past I'm encouraged by folks like Elon Musk that are looking at new technologies for tunnel boring uh, that may speed the process up. And uh, one of the things that our organization was doing last year as a labor management uh, alliance was uh, asking universities whether they could investigate for us uh, what other jurisdictions were doing with respect to new technologies to try to accelerate and speed up the process. Um, we spoke to U of T and Ryerson, McMaster and, and some others. Uh, we wanted to create a competition out of it, but it uh, ended up being a little bit too bureaucratic. Uh, initially we were saying, you know, would consulting engineers do that, but they really wouldn't want to get involved with that kind of competition unless there was some guarantee that they would get the work at the end of the day. So we kind of put that one aside and decided uh, in 2018, let's start a marketing campaign, which we've done with the ads and social media with the Gimme Relief tag and so forth. Right. Just in terms of, you know, some of the other alternatives that have been proposed, I mean, what we are really talking about is a, a peak load problem there, you know, the, the morning rush hour uh, and for a relatively narrow span, like 15, 30 minutes at Bloor Young mm -hmm. Station is the most dangerous time. Other people have simply proposed giving discounted or free fares uh, to at, at off peak times to get people mm -hmm. to, to commute at different times. Would that either delay or reduce the need for the relief line? There are lots of little things that can be done, certainly in encouraging seniors who don't have to be, you know, at a workplace, let's say, uh, first thing in the morning, you know, to ride uh, mid-mornings or mid-afternoons uh, is, is one way that would help. Reduced fares, uh, potentially, you know, depending on who your clientele is, but I believe seniors already have discounted passes. Um, Mayor Tory did uh, provide for free transit for those under 12, and that's in essence uh, been a good thing arguably but it's also created uh, a problem with respect to the revenue that's generated because there has been some uh, slippage with respect to does that person look 12, 13, 14, 15 kind of a thing. So um, there are always going to be some side effects with respect to programs that are related to fares. I think you know we are looking at an integrated fare system right now uh, with respect to trying to link uh, TTC with GO and I think those sorts of initiatives will be helpful if you can have a reduced fare on the GO system that will encourage some people who might only ride the TTC uh, because the GO uh, fares are too expensive to consider GO as an alternate uh, way to get in. So lots of little things are going to help in the long run but the bottom line is we really do need to build this subway project. I wanted to pull out just a little bit and talk a bit more about what's going on in the region. We've got the Crosstown being built, as you say, just, you know, uh, there's a giant pit just a, a few hundred meters from us. <laughs> um, the mayor is committed to smart, smart track. The uh, folks at Pearson want to develop uh, the airport into more of a regional transit hub. Are we uh, biting off more than we can chew? Does the city have too many transit projects going on at the moment? There's a history in Toronto of uh, not being able to l deliver a number of projects at the same time, but our mo more recent uh, experience has been that we can do two projects at the same time. So last December, the Spadina subway extension was opened and we we're working on the Eglinton Crosstown at the very same time. So, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be, you know, doing five projects at the same time, like a Madrid might be able to do, you know, that continuous program. But uh, there are things that we need to be thinking about long term. So there are obviously consultations right now about Relief Line North. And I was just tracking uh, social media based on the meeting last night. And one person said, OK, so you're talking about going roughly from the financial core up to Pape and Danforth. But if you have tunnel boring machines in the ground, why don't you keep going, uh, going north? So those kind of operational things need to be thought a little bit uh, better, I think, in the future. And, and that's maybe been a challenge that we had in the past, like Shepherd. Whether that should have been Shepherd East into Scarborough, you know, like a subway or an LRT, that can be debated. Um, but we should have been doing something uh, to have a more continuous expansion program. That should be a fundamental principle that other jurisdictions have been able to do. And we kind of have a stop-start philosophy. 
we were talking, uh, I, I interrupted the flow here a bit, but we were talking about some of these other regional uh, projects. Why won't they deliver the relief that the relief line will, pardon the pun? Well, there are lots of other regional projects. Uh, you know, Mississauga is uh, looking at here Ontario, uh, and you know uh, that was to go all the way to the downtown part of uh, Brampton. Uh, Hamilton uh, is having its uh, share of uh, politics with respect to the LRT, and I noticed Doug Ford said, "If you councillors can't figure out what to do there, uh, you're going to get the billion dollars, and you can spend it any way you like." Um, you know, again, kind of a political intervention statement, which may not be the best for long-term planning. Um, Ottawa, I don't want to get into the history, but uh, there's uh, a lot of um, debate uh, and going back and forth vis-a-vis uh, -vis east, west, north, south kind of alignments. Uh, but their BRT in Ottawa was very successful, yeah. and I think that's a good model. We're going to see a similar BRT project in uh, in London, Ontario, and then of course uh, the last but not least is uh, Kitchener-Waterloo area is building the ION as an LRT and I think um, the next phase after this will be a BRT connecting to Cambridge. So lots of really good regional projects across uh, the province right now. But none of them serve the purpose of, of relieving the TTC system? No, no. And, and I should say that, um, you know, again, the gurus that I've spoken to, some of the projects that um, seem to be politically motivated, such as high-speed rail, uh, <laughs> are really pipe dreams, uh, I, I think designed to buy votes in southwestern Ontario, but really not to address uh, where the real transit ridership needs are right now, today. I mean, the high-speed rail line was the um, single largest announcement in the most recent government budget. It was uh, the, the Liberal government committing to $11 billion. Um, they are not spending all of that money in a hurry, as it turns out. but that to you, I would take it like that, that $11 billion would be better spent on the relief line. It should be reallocated definitely to the relief line. Why does the smooth running transit system in the city of Toronto, why does that matter to uh, a voter in, let's say, Windsor? I mean, you could understand somebody saying, well, I, I like the idea of a fast train to maybe not to Toronto or London. I don't know what a, a, a Windsor uh, resident wants to travel on, but a, a fast train for them is going to be more useful than a relief line. Why does it matter to a voter outside of Toronto that our subway system works? I think the Toronto Board of Trade used this phrase about 15 years ago and uh, Toronto is basically the, the golden goose and um, uh, even if other cities uh, across the province you know, uh, don't like Toronto, uh, I think they would admit that uh, Toronto is the economic engine of Canada and if we're not globally competitive and we're not attracting uh, people like we've seen, you know, there's been a lot of buzz about, you know, Amazon and the project that uh, Sidewalk Labs Toronto is, is doing in the uh, waterfront area. If we're not um, leading edge and, and attracting um, the kind of new industry, uh, we're not going to be part of the game. And of course, um, major companies are looking uh, to ensure that certain things are in place like housing is you know reasonably affordable uh, that people can get around uh, whether it's you know through transit systems or new mobility and those sorts of things so uh, really uh, unless uh, you don't really care about uh, you know Canada being on the, on the on the global stage and and performing well economically um, you know uh, then sure go ahead and you know say you want to build high-speed rail but otherwise uh, th those are misguided kind of projects I'd like to talk a bit about some of the, the party plans generally, if we could. Um, like, let's start with the, I mean, the NDP have the most clearly spelled out platform. As I, we mentioned already, they have a, uh, a commitment to the relief line. Is there anything else you see in their platform that you like on the transit file? Well, there wasn't a lot of detail with respect to the relief line other than it was identified as a uh, priority. So, um, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, transit, um, I know that um, Andrew Horvath uh, and her transportation critic, uh, in terms of things like road pricing, have called that Lexus lanes in the past. Um, I think that's unfortunate because one of the best ways to alleviate congestion in a region such as ours is through measures, uh, whether it be uh, high occupancy toll lanes like we see right now in the QEW. And, uh, of course, road tolling was talked about uh, by Mayor Tory, and, and that plan got shot down by the 
premier yeah. a little over a year ago. So, um, you know, you don't always have to build transit. There, there are other ways to uh, manage uh, the kind of vehicular volumes that we have in this region. Right. Uh, we mentioned uh, Doug Ford weighing in on the um, LRT issue at Hamilton. Uh, it's not quite clear to what extent the, the party is, the Progressive Conservative Party, is bound by the old people's guarantee. But there was language in that document about uploading subways. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Liberal government also had some language in the most recent budget about potentially uploading subways. Do you think mm-hmm. that's worth exploring? It's worth talking about. Uh, and, you know, again, the Board of Trade uh, talked about the Superlinks concept that would be even larger than the current market area of Metrolink. Yeah, we had Jen DeSilva on the podcast last week. Okay. Uh, uh, the view, I guess, of the RCCA board, at least at this stage, is that, you know, the current Metrolink's boundaries are in place. The more you tinker with governance, probably the more delays you're going to have. So... Uh, Our view, at least from the governance standpoint, is uh, stick with Metrolinks. The ties between uh, Metrolinks and and Queen's Park seem to be pretty strong, and and we've seen some problems in the past uh, with respect to uh, Queen's Park uh, inappropriately intervening on certain issues like the Kirby and Lawrence East GO stations that... um, if Metrolinx firmly believes in its business case analysis, I think it has to stand up and say, you know, these are the merits of these particular projects and this is why we've chosen this project or why we haven't considered these stations or these lines. So I think, again, with respect to the uh, the transit interference uh, from the political realm, we have to be very careful that um, we do have a uh, evidence-based approach rather than a decision-based evidence-making approach. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that, because we want to have a more evidence-based discussion about transit planning. How do you actually get the politics out of transit planning? You'll never get politics completely out of transit planning, but I think more weight has to be given to uh, processes uh, that are in place. So mentioned earlier about the Big Move uh, Regional Transportation Plan document from 2008. The Metrolinx board just in March passed its uh, 2041 Uh, regional transportation plan. And I think there's some good concepts in there uh, that try to reinforce that you do need a business case approach. Uh, You do need kind of a collaborative regional approach when you're talking about priorities. So it can't just be, um, you know, politicians in York saying, you know, we need the Young Street extension before the relief line. Again, relief line, uh, higher priority than any other extension into the 905 or elsewhere right now. Is there some concrete step that you would recommend, uh, some kind of brass tax reform to, I don't know, the Metrolinx board or something like that to try and depoliticize it? I think Phil Verster, who's the uh, CEO of Metrolinx right now, um, stated uh, last year when he first got on the job last fall of 2017, that uh, his focus, for example, was going to be on the RER, the Regional Electrification Project. And I thought that was good because there was some saber rattling uh, at the time where the province was saying, you know, we need to look at um, the uh, basic uh, new concept of, um, you know, hydrogen based uh, power. And from what I understand, Uh, There had been some uh, testing of that concept on light rail in Germany, but it had never been uh, attempted on a heavy rail system like we have. And so, although we've often talked about, you know, made in Ontario solutions and doing things first, I think uh, when you're talking about multi-billions of dollars in long-range planning, you probably don't want to be the first in terms of new concepts unless it's been kind of tried and true elsewhere. And uh, on our last question, tell me about Transport Futures. Okay. RCCO has been a sponsor of Transport Futures since 2008. There's usually uh, two events per year. A number of them have related to mobility pricing, where we bring in speakers uh, from both Canada and internationally, and they talk about what uh, they've done to improve mobility such as funding, governance, all those sorts of really good issues. Because this is an election year and the province is going to the polls on June the 7th, Transport Futures will be having a debate with all four parties on May the 14th, and that'll be taking place at Ennis College, U of T. And uh, really pleased that the moderator for that event will be TVO's own Steve Pakin of The Agenda. All right. Uh, On that note, Andy Manhan, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you so much for the airtime.
Thank you for joining us on the Agenda on Politics. I'm your host, John Michael McGrath. This podcast is produced by Tim Alamenchuk, Colin Ellis, and me with technical production by Matthew O'Mara. Our podcast manager is Hannah Sung. You can email us at onpolitics at tvo.org and follow me on Twitter at jm underscore McGrath. Remember to rate and review us on iTunes. It really helps get the word out. Ontarians head to the polls on June 7th, 2018, and we have a lot to talk about between now and then.